when you were young and your heart was an open book. You used, you used to, to say, live and let live. You know you did. You know you did, yeah. Great theme. Yeah, I, I feel like with this film, because black exploitation films were extremely popular at this time. Like, Yeah, Shaft came out in 1971, and this film comes yeah. out in 1973. So it's, you know, it's yeah. two, two years into... I mean, Shaft was like a real surprise hit, wasn't it? Yeah, and also Pam Greer was also starting her career and like in films like Coffee and all those movies directed by Jack Hill. And so the movie was a, I would say it's, it, it could be seen as like, it's a film that's paying tribute to the films of the black exploitation era. No, but then it, it isn't. But it, then you it, know what they're doing. You know what they're doing. <laughs> they, they're doing the thing we've talked about every single... We, this is the Moonraker problem. It's the it's the playing poker in Casino Royale problem. The Bond franchise is trying to be trendy. They're trying to jump on a trend. Yeah, and it also kind of paves the way for the problems that they sort of landed in during Man with the Golden Gun with the you know the Asian stereotypes and trying to tribute the kung fu genre and things like that. There's so much Orientalism in the first three Roger Moore films because there's also all the Egypt stuff in Yeah, um, that's true. Spy Who Loved Me and. Um, yeah, and this is just full of like, I mean, I, get, I think really we have to speak about it first because you've just got to get out of the way. I mean, there are loads of really great um, black performers in this film. I mean, I think chief among them is is Yafet Koto, who's just a great, great villain and a great actor. Um, yeah, he was, he was very well known for, um, well, he was very well known later for Alien, where he played uh, Parker in that film. Yeah. Yeah, and he's in uh, he's in a great um, episode of Hawaii Five O. He's in um, uh, he's in Five Card Stud with Robert Mitchum and Dean Martin. Uh, Dean Martin. He's in a bunch of stuff, but he's he's a good he's a really good Bond villain. And um, you know, in the very, performances, very, very charismatic as well. I think he's actually yeah. one of the sort of I think out of the Roger Moore Bond movies, I think he's one of the more memorable villains, and I think he's one of the more charismatic villains. I would say. Right, and then you've got you know you've got your Earl Jolly Brown as Whisper, and you've got um, uh, Jeffrey Holder who plays the brilliant uh, Baron Samadhi, incredibly problematic Baron Samadhi, and uh, Julius Harris who plays Teehee, the uh, the one armed um, villain. But the problem is, you know, the problem with this is that the film trades on it doesn't. It's like it hasn't understood what black exploitation is supposed to be about. And yeah, and also it gives the impression that everyone in Harlem is part of a crime syndicate. Right, there's that too. And then, because there, I think there's only like two or three black characters who are not on the side of the bad guys. It's like Quarrel, uh, the CIA guy, and um, uh, what's... Uh, um, Rosie. Oh yeah, Rosie. And, oh yeah, the, the other actor, the CIA agent is uh, Harry Strutter, played by Lon Sat Sasson. Yeah, like those are the only black characters who aren't, you know, you you have you have an entire uh, cast of characters pretending to have a funeral in New Orleans. You have seemingly everyone in Harlem and everyone on uh, this particular made-up island. What is the name they give it again? Um, oh, what's it called? Uh, oh, what was it called? San Monique. San Monique. Yeah. Um, Run by a dictator called Doctor Kananga. Right. And so. Uh, who's also Mr. Big. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Um, Names for tombstones, baby. Uh, the, the, yeah, so, and so you've got that problem. You've got the, the cack-handed deployment of um, black exploitation tropes. But then you also have something which I think is really the issue at the heart of the racism in the film is this misappropriation and, like, complete, like, nonsense stereotyping around um afro-caribbean religions yeah the voodoo stuff is a little bit i don't know i mean i went to when he we tricked me with his black magic and his voodoo, voodoo. <laughs> no but the funny thing is i mean i went to one of the days when we were when we were in new orleans a couple of years ago i went oh, to, that was a good trip <laughs> that was a very very good trip i went to a voodoo museum really 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 cool place and actually it kind of it, it, it there i think there was a moment in in one of the sort of ex in one of the uh, exhibitions there where they actually talked about how movies tend to get do you know they tend to get voodoo quite wrong in those movies where it's actually a little bit more spiritual and it's not all about you know magic and black magic and tricking people and cursing people and things like that so there has been a very sort of 
inaccurate portrayal of voodoo in movies. And I think Live and Let Die is slightly one of them. The final sequence with the snake ceremony, whatever you want to call it, is like, it's like out of the 1930s. It, it really reminds me of a scene in a in an early 40s Western called Unconquered where Gary Cooper like tricks um, Native Americans into not killing the heroine of the film by doing some kind of like magic mumbo jumbo that's supposed to fool them because they're, you know, stupid or whatever. It's just like, it, and it's the same thing in this one, you know, it's this weird cultish stuff and it just completely ignores so many crucial things at the heart of these cultures in the Caribbean and in the Southern United States, which have yeah. legacies of colonialism and slavery that just is never questioned or examined in any way, shape or form. Um, Particularly so, quite a lot of it in Louisiana and in that part of America. Right. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it is just, it is a film which breezes right past that and is, um, yeah, just, I think is hard to watch because of the, um, um because of these things and i think the fact that roger moore kind of responds to uh black culture every time he encounters it with kind of like a smirk and a raised eyebrow just does not help at all like he yeah, doesn't it, it doesn't know, really he's like, he makes fun of everything he sees and tries to like um you know like he goes out of his way to like make fun of it he also um he, he just sort of like James Bond always treats people like shit, but especially women and especially non-white people. And it seems to be yeah. again in this one. And what I think is really peculiar is in Dr. No, which we'll get to, you know, Quarrel, the character of Quarrel in Dr. No is, is one of the most like mistreated characters in all of the Bond franchise. He's such a great um, sidekick to Bond, but Bond like just, he's like, he's made fun of for having like, superstitions he at one point bond tells him to fetch his shoes and so they're like i know what we'll do in this film we'll bring quarrel back it will bring back quarrel jr <laughs> junior like, <laughs> that's like bringing back knickknack jr in the daniel craig movies it's like yeah yeah don't good, don't good, don't, good. don't 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 say that they might do that in no yeah, time good, to good, die good connery reference by the way um, yeah very very good connery reference <laughs> i um yeah so it's um it's a little bit annoying and um and it is, and it's offensive. And especially given the time we're living in now, it's yeah. like, you know, this film still gets shown on telly um, and, and whatever, fine. But like, it it does present like a view of blackness in an urban American setting and blackness in a sort of more Caribbean setting, which is devoid of any of the explaining framework that would help understand even like why these stereotypes have arisen you know there's no attempt yeah. to debunk them and um i and think yeah. one so, of the, the one of the issues i have with it when when you're introduced to san monique it's in it's sort of shown to be like a very poverty stricken place it it's, it's right and full of like suspicion it's like the first scene you yeah. see of san monique is the snake ceremony where they kill the spy right yeah exactly and it's also it's it also it doesn't give it it, it, it it's just it it's quite a stereotypical portrayal of like a very of an of an of a place that's you know primarily you know the population is 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 black people and i think that's that's a little bit problematic and i think that's they could have given that place a little bit more you know like they do in thunderball or even in in any of the other well, in thunderball yeah. in thunderball it's set in the bahamas i mean it's yeah, set in a yeah. real country and in dr no it's set in jamaica you know which yeah. is a real place they just make up a place in of um in called San Monique. What I think is hilarious is that they then they don't show decide, anything of San Monique. All they show they don't show anything of San Monique, but they do imply basically that it had been a British colony because they put the yeah. double decker bus in there. So it's like you know, it's a little bit like um, they've just made a new colony for Britain in a period where you know Britain was shedding colonies left, right, and center because of the decline of the empire. I, I, there's yeah. so much to unpack there, but I just want to just leave. I think basically we can draw a line on it and say. You know, if you're confused, Live and Let Die is a racist film. If yeah. you want to know why, like spend any amount of time reading about, um, you know, the way, um, in, especially in this period, um, urban black populations were vilified by uh, right wing movements in, in America by Richard Nixon, who was in power at this point. You know, yeah. like spend some time reading about that. And as you pointed out as well, like look at how voodoo has been misused in, well, look at how any like, indigenous or, or, or colonial relig like 
religions of colonialized peoples have been used in in popular entertainment um so yeah. I feel like we can leave that there, right? Like, yeah, I think I think we've said enough of that. I think that kind of gives so, a little bit of context to. So we what, talk about the film now. Yeah, I think okay. So this is Roger Moore's first Bond film. Okay, so yes. Sh- Sean Connery had you know he came back to do Diamonds Are Forever, and he would come back to do James Bond, but in a different studio, and never say. We never, never again. we never speak of that film. <laughs> never say never say never again. Yes, never talk. <laughs> Yeah, first rule of Fight Club: Don't talk about never. First say never rule of again. never say never again is don't talk about it, even though yeah. it's probably actually better than we think it is. But maybe we should yeah. watch it together after this is all over. I don't know. Yeah, I think that'd be interesting. Uh, so yeah, Roger Moore was very well known for TV roles. He was mostly well known for his role as si- as Simon Templar in the um, in the TV show The Saint. And I guess by the time he played, I mean by the time he was doing Never Live and Let Die, he was like well into his early forties. And well, he'd also been in The Persuaders with Tony Curtis, right? Yes, he was. He was in The Persuaders. That's so true. That was, he was quite well known for that too, I think, at that point. Yeah, and I think he was, he, yeah, so that, you know, so after, you know, they brought Sean Connery back and and then, you know, they, you know, they brought in Live and Let Die, they brought him in for Live and Let Die and, you know, he was paid like $200,000 plus a percentage of the profits. And so, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting introduction to him. We, we, he's, uh, he's not the cigar smoking Sean Connery Bond we've seen. He's, uh, he's smoking a cigar for, for the most of the time. And also, I mean, he is, he is smoking. Sean Connery didn't smoke a cigar. Yeah. No, no, no. Roger Moore is smoking a cigar, man. So, oh, sorry. Yeah. And, um, and he's also not drinking any vodka martinis. He's like drinking whiskey, like drinks or something like that to kind of differentiate he's a whiskey himself drink. from. He drinks a vodka drink. <laughs> <laughs> and he kills a snake. He finds it in the sink. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I think I mean as a first movie for Roger Moore, I think it's 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 definitely okay. I think you know I think it it's sort of I don't know. I think they came into problems with Roger Moore a little bit later in like in the in his sort of error or error depending on your point of view as 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 Double O Seven. But I think in this one there there is still that kind of you know, especially in the scene with Rosie Carver, where he like threatens her and stuff, there is sort of that kind of viciousness with his character, which sort of goes away a little bit with each movie. But, you know, it's it's a nice, I think he has that kind of like suave and swagger and cheekiness about him that sort of, you know, we're seeing a very different kind of Bond, but one who isn't afraid to like, you know, get his hands dirty a little bit. But I feel like a lot yeah. of, but I feel like, it's, I mean, if you look at like Sean Connery's portrayal, particularly in the early films, he was very slight, you know, he had that sort of kind of swagger, but he was also, you know, but I mean, they downplayed it a little bit, but he was a killer. He was, you know, a man who, you know, as Timothy Dalton said, a man who killed in cold blood or a hero who killed in cold blood. Cold and, blood. In cold blood. And I think, you know, with Roger Moore, I think they started off with that, but I think they sort of shed that away very slowly with each movie. Well, I think well, so I was. I think we we've been hard on Roger Moore, and maybe rightly so, in a lot of these films. But um, I mean, he does bring something else to the part. I mean, and I was I just looked on IMDb. Like he just finished the Persuaders. Like that was his last credit before this movie. So you know, he'd come from a world of like a campy, fun, spoofy spy show, and yeah. he's. I think he takes that persona into these films, and I think it's welcome to some degree because. They tried the Connery clone with Lazenby. No, it didn't work so well, but I do think I do think Lazenby is underrated, and I do think I, I don't say I don't think Lazenby's good, but I do, don't think he's as bad as maybe you and I have implied in the past, and other people have too. Yeah, I think that um, uh, I think that you know Roger Moore has got you know a lot of a lot of people really love Roger Moore. A few people I think you even follow us on on Twitter who who just think, you know, the Roger Moore films are their idea of the perfect Bond films. And it's like, yeah, sure. If that's your interpretation of what the franchise should be, then Roger Moore nails it. You know, it's like, yeah, I mean, um, I'm not, I'm um, not going to like, I'm not going to say like, if, if, if Roger Moore is your favorite Bond, I'm not going to, I'm not going to like get angry with that or say you're wrong or anything like that. If it, if he is your favorite. Well, I, I, you are wrong, but like, you know, <laughs> yeah. we're not going to, we're not going to get But angry. like, but, you, you know, know to, to each their own, I think. Right. You know, no, but, but, but right. Because it is a unique interpretation of the character. He's not trying to do, connery he's not trying to do something he's not even trying to do the character in the books he's just like i'm going to play this my way 
And there's a great confidence in this debut. And I think this yeah, and there is. Spy Who Love Me, The Spy Who Love Me is the best Roger Moore film, but I think this is the second best Roger Moore performance. And, and I actually I think Live and Let Die, I that, yeah. you know, Live and Let Die, if you can stand the racism, I mean, we watch a lot of old films, we watch especially a lot of old Westerns. So you do have to like swallow a lot of problematic shit just to get through the film. If you yeah, can get, just a little you bit. can swallow that, I think Live and Let Die is a pretty entertaining, pretty good, pretty unusual Bond movie. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, I mean, I hadn't seen the movie since, probably since I was like a teenager and I was watching it with, uh, Felina in around the time when everything kind of locked down because of COVID and I hadn't seen the film for a very long time and I was looking at it because we were watching all the Bond movies back to back and it was interesting kind of you know going from Diamonds Are Forever to Live and Let Die and seeing the differences in the interpretation of the character and yes he does bring his kind of campiness to it like he did prob I, I assume in the Persuaders or you know in The Saint as well and it's it's not as bad I mean yeah if you can get past the casual racism it's actually it's not, not casual, <laughs> I mean, but yeah, casual. Yeah. If you can get past that, it's actually a really, really fun film. And there's some really great action sequences, like the boat chase, the very extended boat car chase scene in Louisiana after the whole alligator farm scene is very well filmed and it's really good and it's fun. And I feel like it, well, has, it hits a lot new, of comedy you know, moments. Yeah. It's new. It's like, we haven't really had a boat chase. We had the boat sequence in From Russia With Love, but you know, it's it's a kind of a new mood and i feel like the very america focusedness of this film is is quite unique as well like we don't really probably after diamonds are forever because they've shot a lot of that movie and well they primarily shot that movie in america in las vegas oh, that's right yeah. so, they, I, so i guess too... they carried that on into this yeah movie, shooting it in louisiana and caribbean and places like that that's a good point actually i hadn't remembered yeah diamonds are forever is also largely set in america but this is sort of a different slightly different kind and i think it's interesting that you don't get a lot of Bond films where he's in New York. No, yeah. I mean, in fact, this I, might I, even be the only one. It is the I think it is the only one. It'd be great to see like 007 in like a bigger city in America or, or just, yeah, or some place like that. I think that would be amazing. Yeah. But it's funny because outside of, it doesn't really, I mean, and I think one of the, the problems with this film is that it feels like such a mismatch, this black exploitation genre and 007. Like it's sort of, it feels like he's really out of place, but I think that some of that fish out of waterness works for him. It in... does, yeah, because he feel because every place he goes into, he feels like, oh, I'm safe. I can sit in a booth and order a drink, and then, oh no, it turns around, and then you know, I'm in like Mr. Big's like dungeon or something like that. Yeah, that. Um, in terms of plot, the whole Mr. Big Kananga thing is like the most obvious, stupid like it's, it's so clear it's, it's a little is. it's a little bit confusing i think it doesn't i don't know it doesn't it, it's, I mean, also, it's it's really obvious that he's pretending to be mr big so the whole idea that the audience when he starts taking his makeup off are gonna be like oh my god it's like yeah we we know like and also yeah. the mr big is just not really important to the whole like he's only really important as a vague masquerade anyway um yeah and, and, he's, only in, and, all, and he's only in like two scenes like right exactly very, so very we, don't, anyway, we don't want to get bogged down and all of that but i love tee he's uh, great i love i love that character and i also like baron samady I, I i like that sort of that jeffrey holder's performance in the movie this just this oh his, and his costuming and everything his his yeah he's great <laughs> that bit where they find him in the graveyard playing the flute and they're um, heading for the hill and that yeah his whole his whole vibe is just so great um the um but yeah, I love T. He and I love the alligator farm sequence. The the running across the back of the alligators is one of the great like that's just one of the fun and it's like yes, that does ultimately become what happens in Octopussy, but like just in this moment, what you can get away with it. <laughs> assuming you don't know that there are gonna be six more Roger Moore movies where they're gonna do all like they're gonna keep making it sillier and sillier. Yeah. Um you know you do you that is fun and it is refreshing to watch um you also of course get jw pepper in this and that's another little bit where you're like the bit where he pulls Secret the guy agent <laughs> yeah yeah that's the a bit little where bit where he pulls yeah. the guy over you like watching that in 2020 you're just like oh yeah, yeah i don't know about doesn't, that yeah it doesn't age well <laughs> no and it was it's very like the whole idea of like white cops and black criminals in the south anyway it, it just doesn't it's yeah. very burt reynolds-esque that kind of southern thriller movies where the cops are like corrupt and things like that it's like white lightning yeah at least the cops are sort of 
at least the cops are hopeless but just the sort of atmosphere around it is, is a bit uncomfortable but um, yeah. the, um it's nice to have uh you know the cia on board and felix lice is a great uh addition and david yeah. Henderson is, is the only guy who's played felix lice twice apart from jeffrey wright of course and um yeah and also i like that line the reference to his character in the movies like watch out for sharks and i'm like no felix you watch out for sharks uh, can you say that in tim uh, in timothy dalton voice no felix you watch out for sharks <laughs> <laughs> mr angel <laughs> Oh, we've already become firm friends. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Dougie. Uh, the, um, oh, here yeah. come the fuzz. <laughs> uh, Do the... feel free to spool stop, stop now. Stop, sorry, stop now. Sorry, stop. sorry. I, got, um, I fell down a Timothy Dalton rat, rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, things were about to get nasty. Um, <laughs> hey, Dougie. <laughs> what, what? Anyway. Um, uh, yeah, we were talking about... Uh, you know what's interesting? Yeah. Of all the Bond films, this is probably the one where you and I have been to the most of the like most of the locations together. That is true. Yeah, we have we, been. We've been. We've been to the Caribbean on holiday when we were very little. Yes, we uh, went to Louisiana. We've been to New York as recently as a couple of years ago for my thirtieth yes, birthday. That is true. We had a good. Do you remember that day out we had in Brooklyn? That was fun, wasn't it? Ah, it was really good fun in Williamsburg. That was wonderful. Yeah. Living it up like hipsters. We had oysters yeah. and drank cocktails, and it was. We had, I remember we got the subway across to Manhattan again, and I needed to wee halfway, so we had to get off and find a bar. And uh, yeah, that was true. That was a nice bar, actually. I can't remember the name. Yeah, somewhere in the Barry. I haven't right. I haven't rediscovered it anyway. And then uh, yeah. we've also been. We've also been to New Orleans and the swamps around. Um, uh, around there, you know. So that's true. Like, yeah, th that's going to be a difficult travel round. Uh, anything else before we go into the fun? stuff uh yeah i mean we haven't really talked about jane seymour as uh oh solitaire. yes and also the cards the tarot cards with the 007 on the back yeah that's are a you little... for, are you are you for that or again it like what do you what, I, I think i don't know the whole bit where he seduces her with the tarot cards i think that's a little bit problematic Oh, it's a bit rapey, yeah. It's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit rapey. I don't know. It's just, it's it's sort of a, it's it's along the same lines with the barn scene in Goldfinger, where he seduces a lesbian to like sleep with her and then foil Goldfinger's plan. It's a, yeah, it's a little bit on that on that sort of that 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 plane. Uh, yes, and I don't um, know. I think, and this I think... whole, well, also the whole idea that her religion and his and Kananga's religion is bullshit, and yet when she has her virginity taken from her by Bond. She's no longer able to do the bullshit magic behind the bullshit religion. It's like, well, hang on then. What, what the yeah. hell are you implying? It's like, is is the James Bond franchise implying that the virginity is some kind of holy quality? I don't, whatever. I don't it's, want to get into that. It seems a little bit. I don't know. I don't really know what the hell they were trying to do with with her character. Oh, it's it's it's, it's, it's seemed... messed up. It, it, the the women in this film get such a. This is a bad film for for Bond girls. Like Rosie is, is treated like game. Rosie is disposed of in such a heartless way, and she is treated like this dumb, like um, you know, superstitious. stupid, superstitious, hysterical woman. Like you know, to say nothing of the racism of that. Just the whole like she spends half half her lines are screaming. Like it's just so that is true. Um, but she was least, also she was at also the very least at the very least there is an interracial sexual thing encounter between her and Bond. Yeah, first. Which is, uh, you know, at this time was Bond still, it's st at this time that was still rare in any film or television. So whatever, but still, yeah. it's such, it's so messed up. And the whole thing with Solitaire is, is messed up. But what do you think? My question is the 007 on the back of the tarot cards. Yeah, a bit silly. It's, the same, it's along the same lines with the 007 on the golden bullet in the, in the next one. Yeah, but, that's different because Scaramanga put that there deliberately. Yeah. In this film, why does Kananga have cards which have 007 on the back? I don't know. <laughs> well, that's the whole point. That's what I'm yeah, saying. It's, 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 <laughs> it's a bit silly. Yeah, I don't know. I guess, the, I, guess, um, I guess it was running with that theme of after Goldfinger when, he dis, when they disarm the bond and up the bomb and it goes to 007. So maybe that was like a running joke that were, they were having with the movies or something like that. Or maybe like well, no, no, it's branding. It's just like, but they've just put the branding on the. I feel like it's there as an Easter egg. I, I, yeah, I don't know. Or it's, it's like a he's dumb Easter egg. It's like yeah. an Easter egg to the face. Yeah, um, Doctor Kananga, you're gonna get killed by 007 later in the movie. With a in the stupid. Oh, by the way, okay. Well, anyway, I'll save my. I'll save my stupidest bit. Um, what do you want to do? Our fun stuff. 
yeah uh fun stuff i think the extended boat chase is really fun i think all the sort of gags with the wedding and things like that are really enjoyable and is that your best bit it's but it's i think it's it's definitely one of my favorite bits in the film i think i don't know i think I would say the bit at the end when he saves Solitaire from in the snake bit with the where he's got the magnum, I think that's a pretty cool. I think he looks. I think Roger Moore just kind of really looks the part of a spy in that scene. I think for me, that, I think that's a pretty cool moment where you really feel like, yeah, he's getting into the groove of being James Bond. And also, I mean, even though it's a bit like, hmm. yeah, it's a little bit, yeah. But I think it's it's just it's nice that they sort of change it up a little bit, a bit from the wall to PPK, just to kind of to say this isn't Sean Connery, this isn't George Lazenby, this is Roger Moore and his interpretation and what his look of what Bond is going to be and what. His I mean, he looks he looks great in his little turtleneck and his big. Yeah, he does. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, it's, he's not wearing a kilt like in one of the one of the one of the Bond movies. Yeah, well, like a pink shirt and a wig, like Connery was in the last one. Um, yeah. So is yeah. that your? Are you? Which, so which one is your? Which one is your favorite? I'm, I'm gonna go. I mean, I'm. I know we talked about the boat chase already, but I'm just. I'm gonna go with that scene because I think that's quite a tense scene, and with all the music and stuff, and with the snake, because you know exact because you've seen the beginning scene, you know what's gonna happen, so you're sort of building up like being yeah. like, oh, Bond, please save Solitaire and things like that. So I while think, you don't you don't endorse racism or like the the old sexist trope of the damsel in distress, you do think that bit is is good. Yeah, I think as a as a as a well made scene, if you can just skip all the stuff that's already there, like you mentioned, I think it's 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 pretty good. I think if it, yeah, I think I, I think I think it's fine without sounding like I endorse that sort of thing. Well, I'm I'm coming down on uh, on uh, Alligator Farm uh, in a big way. I, I love that. Um, yeah, I, I would say obviously leads to the boat chase. Yes, I would say the stuff after when he saves Solitaire, I think that's where the film falters. I think it wasn't that the, the sort of ending with Kananga didn't really work. I think that's my least Oh, favorite. I will say though, a backup for, for favorite bit is the train fight. I love a good train fight. Yeah, it's a bit like uh, Robert Shaw in, from Russia with Love. Or Jinx in, um, what's his name? Jinx? No. Mr. Mr. Jinx, yeah. Mr. Jinx, Mr. Jinx, not in, Jinx from Die Another Day, but Mr. Jinx. Uh, yeah. Inspector, that, yeah. Inspector. Um, so yeah, I think I think my favorite, I think I am going to go with Alligator Farm because that's just really fun. And, you know, the, I always love when they introduce like gimmicky wildlife stuff into Bond movies. What's your stupidest bit? Stupidest bit? Um, the dart that comes out of the the side mirror in the car. Yeah, that's ridiculous. How that's that's that? that's a really stupid bit. I don't know. That just feels like some scene out of like a spy show that was coming out of that time. I don't know. It just seems that's like just, Thunderbirds level. Yeah, it is a bit. I don't know. I just just it's a bit silly. I don't know. I feel like the New York stuff. They could have really. I don't know. I feel like given the location and given what New York was in that period in time. Because New York was just like, it was near bankrupt quite a lot. The mafia were kind of running it and stuff. They could have really done something really noir-esque with it. I don't know. But yeah, I feel like that location was squandered and not used to its potential. And I think that yeah. scene in particular was a little bit silly. And if you want to see how New York was used to its potential in this exact same period, which is what Shaft, because that's brilliant. Yeah, film. exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, for me, it's uh, my stupidest bit is another projectile, and it is the little compressed air ball that the bullet um, the that uh roger moore makes kananga swallow and he inflates and he blows up he certainly had an inflated opinion of, of himself uh, it's like you've you've it's you've where the puns he started <laughs> he has an underground layer he uh he has um you know a shark tank and they he dies in this really unsatisfactory anticlimactic way so that's yeah. the stupidest bit for me yeah uh, favorite location? Hmm. Well, the place I'd want to go. Um, you can't well, say New Orleans because you've already been there. Right. Oh, so I have to be somewhere I haven't been already. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess I haven't been to San Monique, so I guess I. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you can, I mean, you can say New Orleans because there's not really much choice in this. I, I love, I love New Orleans. I think I'll go to the Caribbean though because I, I, I love, I, I fancy a palm tree holiday. What about you? You're going to say New uh, Orleans. Yeah, I'll probably go back to New Orleans. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was. It or, is or, or James Bond's house, depending on where that is. That's another stupid bit. Um, yeah, like, how does he? Bit. How does he have like a house that big? Well, he's obviously well paid. I mean, he's, yeah, I know. But maybe they, maybe it's even on the taxpayers' dime. But just that whole first sequence is so like with the French spy. Carry on, yeah, it's so carry on movie and. Um, oh, matron. 
Yeah, there's no there's no Q in this film either. There's no there is no Q. That's true. There's no Desmond Llewellyn. Yeah, that is, that is very true. I was I remember that. That's, that is yeah. Lois Maxwell's in it for like two seconds, and you know Bernard yeah, Lee same. M. Yeah. But there's no Q. No Q. Yeah, he didn't show um, up until the uh, Man with the Golden Gun. Solix Agitator. Um, what's the next thing? Locations? Oh, cast recasting. Who recasting. Recast? Um, I would go a bit interesting with the casting, and I oh, would. Right would maybe i don't know i would i even though i did like yafet kodo as dr kananga and i think he's a really good villain i would it's it's i would have it's it, like thinking about it now maybe swapping him out for james l jones oh yes i think that would have been pretty cool a young james l jones would be yeah that's a bit like for like though because i do think yafet kodo is very good uh yeah, in that film, I think that um, I would um, let's see. I haven't given this any thought. Um, it's hard because this is one of those ones that's quite well. Yeah, everyone's pretty well cast. Pretty, I think pretty good. Just for like what the fuck value casting? Uh, just uh, eat. Okay, one of two solutions: have Quarrel Junior played by Chris Tucker. <laughs> James, James! <laughs> yeah. Hey, Mr. Man! Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm double off seven. Where you at, man? <laughs> um, or have um, J.W. Pepper played by, like, um, John Wayne. Yeah, that would be interesting. <laughs> yeah. uh, including in Man with the Golden Gun. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's interesting. What? I don't know. Someone on Twitter the other day pointed out, like, Sheriff J.W. Pepper, a man who goes to Thailand to test drive an American car. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Right? We, yeah. we didn't even we didn't even get to that on the last episode. Yeah. What uh it's it, oh, I, I will point out uh, we should talk about Guy Hamilton, uh the director. He also he directed Diamonds Are Forever and The Man with the Golden Gun and he directed Goldfinger. He likes gold. Um Yeah, so in in between then he's he did, also by the way he was assistant director on The Third Man. Yeah, and he also and oh wait, I think he also wait I, no he didn't oh he directed uh, Force Ten from Navarone. Oh yeah, that's fun. That's a fun movie. And um, and he also did Battle of Britain with uh, with uh, Michael Caine. Michael Caine and everyone else. Yeah, I that's one seen... of those like longest day bridge too far. All the stars in one war film in one mm. quite long war film. Yeah, um, they don't make Battle of Britain's anymore. fun. Battle of Britain's a fun movie. Um, I haven't seen it. What is your favorite color? Uh, what is um, blue? No. What else do we? What else do we do <laughs> in this sequence? Do we say something? Uh, done favorite bits, stupid bits, recasting. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Uh, no, oh, no, no, no. rating. Uh, rating. Ah, uh, I would say three and a half martinis. I would too, but I'm going to take away half a point for the racism, so just give it three. <laughs> 